Hello, uh, my name is John, and I am here to talk about multi-module repositories. Um, so the tricky thing about this talk is that it actually requires a decent amount of um, sort of pre-knowledge about modules and MVS. So the format of this talk is um, we're going to start with um, just some level setting on um, a couple of pieces of modules, a, a quick look at MVS, and then we're going to dive into um, what are multi-module repositories and, and how do they work? And then we'll end with um, uh, sort of like the subtlety of multi-module repositories. Um, so with that, um, modules are finally here. Um, mostly, they're mostly here. Um, so we, we started with this experiment called Vigo. Um, and, uh, and it was successful, so they rolled it into the Go toolchain as Go mod. Um, and in 1.11, um, you know, I like to think of it, and th this is very non-official, right? But I like to think of it as sort of like a very alpha state. Um, they had a couple of main use cases flushed out, and over time, the amount of bugs decreased and so on, but um, it was a little bit rough for some library maintainers here and there. Um, by 1.12, where we are now, um, a much better state. Um, a lot of use cases are flushed out, and there's very few bugs, and, and if you run into a problem, it's going to be pretty esoteric stuff like multi-modules. Um, and then by 1.13, um, it'll get turned on by default. In, in, in 11 and 12, it was, it was not turned on by default. Um, so by that point, it should be um, very stable. Um, so with that said, what, what are modules? Well, for this talk, we're going to use this fictional repository that I've created. It's called Builder 9000. And um, Builder 9000 has a couple of packages in it, um, a compiler, a linker, um, and an optimizer, and, and so on and so on. And these are just completely made up. Um, I, I'd like you to think of this thing as something that other people depend on. right? This is a library um, that people consume. And how do we represent this um, as a module? Well, um, simply, if I have a Godop mod at the root, um, it's going to define a module that contains all of these packages. So if someone depends on the module, they get the packages. And the, the, the Godop mod file is pretty simple. Um, there is a um, module definition at the top. And you'll notice that the path is the name, which makes things pretty simple. It's a very Go thing to do. Um, and then next, we have this Go definition. Um, this says, I expect to be compiled with Go 112. Maybe I'm using some specific Go 112 features or, or whatever it might be. Um, this is completely optional, um, but uh, I include it because when you do a Go mod in it, you, you'll get it. Um, and then this is the key piece, is, is the require, require statements. So, so this module says, I depend on dep, dep1, dep2, dep3 at various versions. And the key piece about this is um, these ha actually have to be dependencies of packages. So maybe the generator depends on dep1, and maybe the compiler depends on dep2, and uh, like internal depends on dep3, maybe. Um, but if, if no package actually depends on these, then the next time you do a GoMod tidy, these will just get blown away. So they actually are dependencies of your library. Um, so to think about MVS, and, and especially the one aspect of MVS I want to touch on today that's going to be relevant later, let's imagine that there's some fictional user depending on this library, as well as some other library, and yet another library. So three libraries. And here are their, um, the Go mods for these three libraries. And you'll notice that each of these libraries themselves depend on this library called dep2. Right? So the user transitively depends on dep2 in three ways. It depends on dep2 via the Builder 9000 module um, at 1.7.2. It depends on dep2 at 1.9.8 through some other lib, and it depends on dep2 v2 at version 2.1.4. The slash v2 is significant. We'll get to that in a second. So um, the question is, how do we choose the version of dep2 to use? Right? It's pretty obvious. For dep1, I'm just going to use um, 0.37.1, right? because there's only one version specified. But dep2 has multiple versions specified. And this is where different packet managers do different things, like I'm going to do set solving, or I'm going to do whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, the way MVS works is we take all of these dependencies and we build a dependency list. Right? Again, for dep1, it's really simple. There's one version. I'm going to use that one version. For dep2, there's three versions. So MVS is going to bucket things based on their major version. You're going to get at least one version for every major that you need, right? Um, ignoring v0 and v1. But um, for v1, there's two versions, 1.7.2 and 1.9.8. For v2, there's a single version, which is 2.1.4. 
So v2 by itself is fine. We're just going to use 2.1.4 for v2. What do we do for v1? It's super simple. We just do a max. And the max of those two numbers is 1.9.8. So there we go. So there's a lot more to MVS than that. But this piece is what's going to be really crucial for multi-module repositories. Um, so keep this in mind. We do a max when there's multiple versions specified. OK. So this talk is not about module repositories. It's about multi-module repositories. So let's take a look at a multi-module repository using the exact same Builder 9000. We're going to imagine it having multiple modules. So here's Builder 9000 again. I have three Godot mods now, right? I have one in compiler, and I have one in linker as well. And what happens is um, the module is re uh, includes packages recursively down until it sees another Godot mod. And then that, that Godot mod carves out a module out of the existing like upper level uh, module. And by the way, I, I might slip up, but I'm going to try to not use the terms like parent or submodule because it kind of conflates it with uh, git modules or, or directories, and it's, it's completely different from these things. So um, look out for that, but sorry if I mess up. Um, so OK, so now I've carved out two different modules out of my sort of upper level module, right? And what do their names look like? Um, well, again, it's, it's quite simple. Um, it is just the path. Um, if you are a lower level module, you just have a longer path that includes your, your, um, uh, all the, the parts uh, leading up to you. Um, and I can have as many of these as I want, uh, and at any level. So I can, I can have this Lexer broken up. Um, Lexer is carved out of compiler, and co compiler is carved out of Builder 9000. Um, and then, and then what are the rules for modules? Well, modules can depend on each other inside a repository, just like they can depend on each other outside of a repository. So modules really don't care about which repository they're in. They, their dependency rules are exactly the same inside as outside. Um, and as a library owner, this took a while to get used to, but it sort of makes sense. Um, again, they don't care about repositories. They are just these, these semantic things, and they can depend on their neighbors, and they're, they're like directory children. Um, as if they're completely unrelated. Um, and then this next piece is unrelated to multi-module repositories, given the last point. But there is cycles. You can have cycles in modules. You can't have cycles in packages, because the Go compiler doesn't like that. But you can have cycles in modules. Um, so that is uh, multi-module repositories. And what we're going to do now is we're really going to get into the meat of this. We're going to look at what it takes to add a module to a multi-module repository, to make a repository a multi-module repository. And it turns out what we found at Google is that um, this process, although all the core pieces are simple and the, um, the sort of the initiative is obvious, there's many repositories that you can immediately think, like, yeah, I want, I want multiple modules in this setup. Um, it, it actually can be pretty tricky to maintain this thing. And, and you can subtly get it wrong that shoots users in the foot. Um, which you know nobody wants that. So um, let's take a look at what adding a module looks like. So okay, so here we have our old repository, and um, we want to add the compiler package um, and all of its descendants as a um, as a separate module, right? And let's imagine that Builder 9000 is just at version 1.0.3, just some made-up version right now. Um, let's go ahead and add uh, compiler, right? So here's what I do. I'm going to cd into compiler. I'm going to do a gomod init. Um, I'm going to uh, gomod tidy, which codifies my dependencies. And then I'm going to commit and push, right? Wow, that was so simple. That was no big deal. Um, well, we already forgot something, which was uh, we need to specify a version. So how do you do a version for something that's not at the root? Well, um, again, gomod um, stuff is pretty simple at the base of it. It's really just the root um, module gets just version, which is probably what 90% of projects are going to look like. And then if you have a module that's below the root of the repository, you append the path to it from the root. Right? So the compiler is compiler slash whatever version. And then the lexer, which is two down, is compiler slash lexer slash version. So these are the tags that you would use. And GoMod understands this. If you do lexer at you know, v1.3.7, it's going to look for the specific tag with the specific path. Um, OK, well, so great. That's easy. What could go wrong? Everything builds fine on my side. Everything tests fine on my side. Like, as a library developer, this seems easy. 
This is what happens when a user tries to use your code, right? They get this error, ambiguous import, I found this module twice. I found your compiler module in builder9000 slash compiler, which is the module you just pushed, and I found it in the old builder9000 v1.0.3. What gives, right? So let's take a look at that. I'm a very visual person, so let's look at this visually. Um, here's, again, this is the, the state before. Um, we had just this one mega module. And taking a look at the package imports as well as the module, if the user is using us and importing us as packages, let's say they import the Builder 9000 package and the compiler package. Both of these packages are provided by a single module before we messed stuff up by getting into multi-module repositories, right? Both of them are provided by a single module. Everything's fine. And then we went into this wackiness where we defined more modules below the root. And then this happened. This compiler module is now suddenly provided by two different modules, right? Or sorry, the compiler package is provided by two different modules. So the um, Go compiler, poor, poor naming choice there, Go compiler complains. So OK, so we need a way to fix this. It's not OK to just say, OK, user, please upgrade your version of Builder 9000 to a version that doesn't have um, you know, the compiler in it anymore. Um, we certainly can't go back, back in time and rewrite history, like edit our tags or some craziness like that. Um, so we need a way forward where the user doesn't get broken by this change. And this is how it works. So we're going to take our, our old process, and we're going to amend it a little bit. Here's our old broken process, and we're going to do a couple of edits to it, right? Right after we codify our dependencies, we're actually going to add a fake dependency from compiler to Builder 9000 at a version that doesn't exist yet, v1.1.0. Remember, our previous version is 1.0.3. So we're adding a dependency to a version that doesn't exist yet. And then we're going to tag the commit with two tags instead of one. We're going to tag it as this v1.1.0 which is the, this thing that doesn't exist yet. And again, remember, there's no path. So this is the root. This is the Builder 9000 compile uh, uh, module. And then we're also going to uh, push the commit and both of the tags as one shot. So this is kind of some wacky stuff. Let's take a look at this more in depth. The, and the key piece is this requirement. We, we're leaning on that property that we talked about way at the beginning of the talk, that max piece of MVS. We're leaning on that MVS property to make all of this work smoothly, right? Um, and here's how it works. Again, visual person. Um, so we have um, just a bunch of versions here. I've made up a couple more you know, into the future. Um, several of these versions are sort of poisoned, right? All of our versions before 1.1.0 are poisoned. If the user were to depend on um, the compiler module as well as these pre-carve-out versions, they get the compiler package twice. And they blow up, right? So what we want is a way that a user could have the exact same Godop mod, where they depend on the like wrong version of uh, Builder 9000 100, but they don't get you know the ambiguous import uh, problem. So what we do is we've added this dependency from compiler into Builder 9000, right? And because of the max property of MVS, MVS will never choose a version less than 1.1.0, right? And so we've sort of solved this problem. The user can have anything above 1.1.0, but below 1.1.0, it'll, it'll, it'll um, pop up to 1.1.0. So we sort of solved this problem for users. But as I start, said at the, at the start of this talk, this is subtle. This is a little bit hard to see when you're getting into multi-module repositories. And so at the end of the day, the message is just be careful, right? Start somewhere simpler. Consider splitting out your, your uh, dependencies into, into separate repositories um, before getting into multi-module repositories, because there is quite a bit of um, subtlety and, and, and work that goes, that goes into it. Um, so thank you. I hope that was interesting. <laughs>